Amen. Well, we are in James chapter 1 today. If you've got a Bible, go to James chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one underneath the seat in front of you. We are in, we're in this letter. We're in, we have been over the last several months in a couple of books of the Bible in the Old Testament, Ruth and Nehemiah, uh, that, it, that is very, very different than what we're getting ready to go into, okay? Uh, we, we've been in some stories, the story of Ruth, the story of Nehemiah, and, uh, and what we have done, how we've approached these books is we look at it and it's like, okay, here's what's going on with Ruth, here's what's going on with Nehemiah, and what does that mean for us? So what What's happening there in that story? What in the world does that mean for us and how we live out our lives today? Like how how do we think about God and how we should live? James is very, very different. James is very different. It's, It's a New Testament book that is not a story at all. It's a letter. It's a letter that is written um and it's very direct. It is not, it is like there's no guesswork here. Uh you don't have to look very hard to know what it means and how we should live. Book of James was written in the mid 40s, that is the mid 40s. AD. It was written 15 years uh, after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And there are five chapters can, in, in the book of James. There are 108 verses in the book of James, and 54 of those verses are imperatives or commands, or say, they are to say, hey, this is what you do. This is how you live. This is, James is not playing around in this letter. He wants us to know, hey, this is who you are, and this is how they out there will know what's happening in here is legit, and it's by what you do. It's by how you live. It's by what you put into action. James, does, James doesn't complicate things. It's, it's pretty simple. It's very direct. He's going, look, if you have a faith in Jesus, here's how that faith plays out in what you say. Here's how it plays out in how you think about money. Here's how it plays out in how you think about when you don't have money. It, it's how it plays out in how you think about others who have money and, 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 and how you think about others who don't have money. Here's how, it's, here's how faith plays out in how uh, you approach conflict. And here's how you face suffering and sickness. James makes it his aim to make sure that we are not simply talking about Jesus, answering questions about Jesus, singing songs about Jesus, but he wants to, he wants to make sure that we are all very, very aware and very confident that you believe, that we believe Jesus. He's going, do you believe Jesus? Because if you believe Jesus, then it will change what you do. Churches, are filled with people who have no problem saying what they think, but are not doing what they say they believe. And at the end of the day, it may be because we, what James is going to say, it may be because we don't really believe what we say we believe. Because real life is lived out, a real faith is, is lived out in real life. So let's jump in. James chapter 1, verse 1. This is not going to be like Nehemiah where we go through a chapter at a time. It's five chapters. I don't know. We're going to probably go through the summer in in James, all right? And uh, we're going to take our time. And you're going to see that right off the bat. He starts off with James. So let's stop right there, all right? Uh, right Right off the bat, we're introduced to the author, the writer of this letter. This is James. So who is James? Who is this guy? James is the half brother of none other than Jesus himself. Half brother because Mary was the, the mother of Jesus and James, but God is the father of Jesus and Joseph is the father of James. And as it turns out, after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph, like, they had lots of kids. They had a lot of kids. We see that in Mark chapter 6. Um, there, Jesus had come back to his hometown and he had been doing some things. He just started doing uh, a lot of these things in his ministry that were like wowing a lot of the people, like bringing the crowds, uh, you know, healing people and preaching and, and saying things that nobody had ever said and, and all of these things. And he comes back to his hometown and this is what they say about him. They say this, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us? In other words, they're going, wait, we saw this kid grow up. Like, isn't that who this guy is? He's got these four brothers and he's got these sisters. Like, isn't that who this is? So Jesus has four brothers and he has got at least a couple of sisters. Now, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about, can you imagine what it was like growing up with Jesus as an older brother? Like, he, 
Like, I, I don't... So, as a father, probably one of the more... Fr- I mean, there's lots of things that are a joy, but there are some frustrations every once in a while in, in parenting and being a father. And I would say one of the top frustrating things for me like, that was ongoing as my kids were younger um, was when, my, when two children would come to me and they would sit, and both of them were very much not happy. And they would begin to express why they weren't happy. And the reason that they were not happy was because of something that the other, the other person did. And so it was always this, like, I'm sure you've, if you have kids, you've never dealt with this. But, but they would come to me, and they were like, Dad, he did this. And, and then it'd be like, the aunt, well, she did this. Well, well, she, he did. And in that moment, I don't have a clue what to do. Like, I'm, I'm, like, I don't know. I don't know what to, like, it is a moment. Like, I don't know who's lying to me because all the kids are liars. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to believe here. And, but I'm, I can't project weakness. Like, you know that, right? You can't project weakness here. Like, you got to be like, I got this figured out. Like, I, I know what's going on. And so, like, you're, you're there. And you're, but, but inside, you're going, I don't have a clue what's happening. I don't know what, who did what and how. And, and I don't know how to, to deal with this. And it's just like you, but, but you just put on. Like, I, I got, I, I know what's, what's happening. Listen, Mary and Joseph didn't have to do any of that with Jesus. Like, they didn't have to deal with any of that. Like, if it was Jesus and James coming before Mary, you know, and she's going, and they're going, Mom, he did this, and he did this. I mean, all Mary had to do was like, Jesus, hold on, hold on, hold on. Jesus, what happened? All right. It's like, James, you're grounded. Go to your room. Like, that's every time, every time. Like, this was, now you think, I know you think, well, no, I'm, I'm sure that they, revered their brother. There was something there. There was something there like, because he was always doing the right thing. I mean, he never, he never, I mean, I'm sure he was always respectful because that's the way kids are. They always revere those who always do the right thing, right? Um, but here's what we know. Here's what we know. So Jesus goes on and to do like what he does, what he came here to do. And he preaches and he, and he does miracles and he does all of these things. And, and do you know, do you know, like all these people were, were coming to believe in Jesus. They're, they're coming to like, they're coming to say, no, I'm, I'm with that guy. I mean, he's, he's going from city to city, healing, casting out demons, preaching the message that he has come from God and calling people to repent and calling people to follow him. I mean, a lot of people were beginning to believe like, no, he, he's the guy. Like, he's the one we've been waiting for and they follow Jesus. But you know, do you know who did not believe him? James. James didn't believe him. In fact, what the scripture tells us, the, 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 the word uh, that, that the scripture uses is, the, the phrase that the scripture uses is they thought that his brothers and sisters, Jesus' brothers and sisters thought Jesus was out of his mind. That's what they thought. That he was out of his mind. But think about it. Like, for those of you who have like an older brother, Right? What in the world would it take for you to believe that your older brother was God? Like, what, what would your older brother have to do to go, for you to go, oh, so you're God. Like, you're limitly God. Like, that's a stretch, right? Like, you, that would be, like, you're like, there's, there's just no way. And, 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 and people are going to, like, to James and the, the, his, his other brothers and sisters and go, look, he healed that guy. That guy was blind and literally your brother made that guy see. And James is going, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) That's James. He's a skeptic. He's an unbeliever. But then watch this. Here's how James introduces himself in this letter. This is like his social media bio right here. Here we go. James, a servant of God, all right, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like, what? How did, how did James go from, I think he's crazy, to I am a servant of my big brother, the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, let me clue you in to what happened. Back in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he's talking about the, the resurrection. He's talking about something significant here. And here's what he says. I just want to read this to you. Here, check this out. We get, a, we get a clue right here. For I delivered to you, this is Paul saying to the Corinthians, 
I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. That's what he says. Then he appeared to to James. What moved James from, I think he's crazy, to I'm his servant. He's my Lord. What happened? James is going, he rose from the dead. I mean, he rose from the dead. I mean, yeah, okay. So I didn't believe it when I saw the miracles and heard about, you know, to heard all of his teaching and all that. I wouldn't buy it. But my brother rose from the dead. He rose from from, I saw him alive after he was crucified and buried, and that changed everything. And James says, I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know. If it were me, I think, I don't know. I think that I would say, I am the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm pretty sure that's what I would say. That's not what James says. James is going, no, 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 the most significant thing about me is not that Jesus is my half-brother, but that I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that's powerful. Did you know that if you follow Jesus, the most significant thing about you is that you are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? We identify as a lot of things. We have a lot of roles in our life. A lot of us wear a lot of hats. Maybe you're a manager of your division or where, where you work, or you're an owner of a business, or a student, or an athlete, or a coach, a husband, a wife, a mom, or dad. But there is no bigger deal in your life. There is no identity that is more significant than in my life than Stephen, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you may be a servant teacher of the Lord Jesus Christ, a servant electrician of the Lord Jesus Christ, a servant athlete of the Lord Jesus Christ, a servant nurse of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the biggest deal about you is that you are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you and I give ourselves to, for the benefit of others, when we, whether it be on the job or whether, wherever we're at, when we give ourselves for the benefit of others, we are servants of Jesus. When I am selfish, when I ignore the needs of others, when I am a, a source of contention and conflict wherever I go, when I am unforgiving, I am a servant of myself. It, it was Jesus who said that when, he get, that when we give the hungry food, when we take care of the immigrants, when we clothe the poor, he, Jesus said this, that's when you are a servant of me. Jesus, he said it this way. He said, for even the son of man, he said this about himself, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. And so James is going, I'm just going to do what my, my, my brother did. I'm going to be a servant, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then James tells us who this letter is written to. He says, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. The 12 tw tribes in the dispersion. I was like, who, what is this? What's, what's, what, who's he talking about? Well, in the Old Testament, Israel was described as the 12 tribes. They, there, so there are two audiences here for James' letter. The immediate audience, the direct audience, who James was writing to directly, were those who were living outside of Israel, those who belonged in Israel, who belonged in Jerusalem, who grew, like that's where their family, that's where their roots were, but they had, they're now living outside of Israel. So it's those Jews in, who follow Jesus that are scattered throughout the world. And then the second audience letter applies to would be all the followers of Jesus today scattered throughout the world. And that's us. That's us. That every, every, every follower, uh, it's every follower of Jesus. That un, unlike every religion in the world, Christianity does not have a center. Christianity does not have a home. Unlike the Muslims and Hindus every, every, in every religion in the world, Christianity doesn't have a place where you go and say, oh, that's where Christianity, that's the capital of Christianity right there. No, we are a scattered people living among, among people who do not follow Jesus. And that's the way it will be until Jesus returns and brings heaven to earth, and then we will have our home. 
So James is going, living in this world as, as a, that is broken among people who do not follow Jesus, here's how you live. And James doesn't waste any time getting to something that we all feel. So here's what he says. He says, count it all joy, my brothers. And in, in, in your Bible, it, there's a, a line at the bottom that says, and sisters. Anytime that we see that throughout here, it's actually a Greek word that refers to both uh, brothers and sisters. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. So right out of the gate, James is going, this is how real faith is lived out in trials. This is how real faith is lived out when hard times come. So Acts chapter 11 tells us why the Jewish Christians suddenly left their home in Jerusalem. Like, why are all these people who are from Jerusalem, from Israel, why are they now scattered throughout the world? Well, Acts 11 tells us, tells us why. After Jesus' resurrection, many Jews were becoming followers of Jesus. Many Jews were, were saying, okay, I didn't see it then, but I see it now. He rose from the dead. I'm in. Like that guy, I'm in on that guy. I believe that he is the one sent from God. And so there, were, there was a growing pressure among the, the Jews that, that we, need to, we need to put an end to this thing. We got to put an end to these people following this Jesus, becoming these little Christ, these Christians. We got we to put an end to this. And so they started persecuting those who identify with Jesus. They started persecuting their own Jewish brothers and sisters who identified with Jesus and say, no, he is the one. And so Jewish leaders uh, were, were, would go into the homes of these Christians and pull them out and put them in prison or they would pull them away from their family and separate them. And then you have guys like Saul, who was a Jewish leader, who we know now as Paul, who wrote what we, I just read earlier from Corinthians. Paul, or Saul, this guy, one day he takes one, uh, one, one, like, he is a leader, an up and, up and coming leader in Christianity. His name is Stephen. And he takes him to the middle, in the middle of the street and he gives permission and he orders for the, for the death of Stephen right there in the, middle of, uh, in the middle of the street. And they take stones and they stone Stephen to death. Well, after that, instead of these Jewish Christians changing their mind going, okay, we'll, for Jesus, we'll, we, we, won't, we don't want to lose our family, we don't want to lose our lives, Instead of that, they scatter. They're going, we can't deny Jesus. We can't deny what we know to be true. And so they scatter. They scattered all over the world. So when James talks about trials of various kinds, he's talking about a people who have left their home, left family. He's talking about people going through poverty, injustice, conflict, grief, and loss. And for us, man, we get it, Right? I mean, just by being human beings, we understand grief and loss and conflict. And then you pile on that, all that comes with following Jesus in a place where people do not follow Jesus, persecution, injustice, loneliness. And J James is going, and this is what we all have in common. We go through hard stuff. There's nobody, listen, there's nobody in this room right now going, Stephen, I really, really wish you'd something that's a little bit more relevant to my life. Like, I just don't know what you're talking about. Like, I've heard of people going through hard stuff, but that's just not my reality. No, this is all of us. In fact, what tends to happen is we tend to go the other way. It's easy when you're going through some stuff that it's easy, it's easy for us to go, well, my thing is different than everybody else's thing. Like, nobody's been through the thing that I've gone through. Like, nobody's been in my situation. Like nobody, like, like, and we go, we, we, and, and so what we want to do is, like, well, this might be helpful for you, but it's, in your thing that you're going through, but what I'm going through is different. The, the, the rules don't apply to us. My thing is the exception. And James is going, no, 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 no. Trials may come in different ways and in different degrees, but this is something that we all go through. So whatever your thing is, like, you know, it don't matter, it don't matter what, you know, what kind of family you came out of or how much money you make or how old you are. Like whatever your thing is, whatever it is that you might be going through right now, if you have a real faith in Jesus, Paul, or James is going, this is how faith works in that, in that thing. And he says, count it all joy when you meet trials. Count, or it may say in your Bible, consider, consider it all joy. In other words, James is not telling us how we need to feel in a trial. He's telling us how we need to think 
And he's not just saying that you just need to, to fake your way through it, just pretend that everything is okay, just, you know, just, just act like it's a joy thing in this trial. Just, just act like it. Just, just pretend your way through it. That's not it. That's not helpful. Honestly, the, the way in which the world deals with it is, like, what are we, what are we told to do? We're, we're told to, well, deny it, and maybe it'll go away. Or resent it and get bitter. Because after all, as long as there are trials in your life, you can't have joy. So as by all means possible, avoid the trial so you can get on with your life with joy. And unfortunately, Christians have caught their cues for dealing with hard times from the world. And it has sabotaged the church. Because for years and years, the church has been one of the greatest cover-up societies in history. Like, I don't know how you grew up, but I'll tell you how I grew up. I'll tell you what the church was like back in the 80s and 90s. Because we would preach how you behave. Here's how you behave like a Christian. And then condemn those who didn't live up to those standards. And so what we what happened? A church full of people would go, amen, amen, and then nobody would dare to bring up their issues. Like, nobody would ever dare to say, I've, I've got some pride on, like, I don't line up here. And then when we would put stories out, we would only ever put stories of success out there. You come to Jesus, and like, like, look what happens. He cleans you up, he makes you great, makes you good. We put stories of, out, out there of, of stories of overcoming, the stories of people who have it all together, and what happened? All of the unsuccessful, non-overcomers, non-have-it-all-together people look at the church and go, well, obviously there's no place for me there. And, and generations of kids, my friends, grew up in the church under all of this stuff. And when they realized, when they got to a certain age, and they realized, well, I can't live like that. Like, I don't, have, I don't know how they got it all together, but I don't have it all together. And they're going, well, it's not for me either. And so generations of kids just left the church. And the truth is, though, well, I mean, come on, we know. Let's just be real. Kids would go home. And, yeah, it was a, you know, moral place. We don't cuss here. We don't, you know, drink here or whatever it is that, you know, that home thought was the moral thing to do. But those homes were just as angry and just as bitter and void of any kind of real joy. And so they're going, well, I'm not even sure it's worth it. I'm not even sure it's even worth living. Like, like why would I want that? Like, like, at least go out there and at least everybody, like my friends seem, seem like they're having a good time doing all this other stuff that the church condemns. And there's no joy here. And the tragedy is that we shroud all of that and we call it Christianity. I don't know about you, but I want to be part of a generation of the church that is done with all of that. Because we believe the gospel to be true. And because we believe it, we know we have a place to go with all of our sin and mess that we don't need to hide it. But we want to be free from it, and we believe God can do that. And that in actually admitting the mess that we're in, then maybe, just maybe, that that would cause our children and those on the outside to turn to the wonder of who God really is, that he would dare to love and rescue a mess like us, rather than trying to get the world to be impressed with how great we are. The truth is that every one of us here whether we've been following Jesus for 50 years or you're just here and you think we're all nuts. The one thing that we have in common is that we all come in here bringing our own trials, our own temptations and fears and failures and disappointments. And what James is going to tell us is that if you have faith in Jesus, you are not left powerless. You do not have to live a life whether it, and, and try to figure out, am I going to live, is it a trial or joy? Is it a trial or joy, or joy? What is it? But when Jesus died and was raised for you, he brought you, he brought you for you a life where there is joy even in the trial. James says when trials come, here's what you do. 
You count it all joy. You count it all joy, or you count it pure joy. Now, why would, why would we ever consider trials to be pure joy? Here's, what, here's where he answers. He says, for you know, for you know. Again, this is not about feeling something. This is about knowing something. It's about the way you think. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So the first thing that James wants us to, to know is to, cons- to consider is that trials are, are, can be a joy. Is it, it, to, to know that trials are a joy, to get to the place where you know that trials are a joy, that you see trials as, or as a joy, is that you got to see that the trial is actually a test, that it's a test of your faith. That is, do you have a faith that is steadfast, that you would have a faith that endures? Because the truth is, there is coming a day when every person is going to stand before God, and God's goal from now until that day is to prepare you for that day. Because it doesn't matter what you say today. It doesn't matter. What matters is, it doesn't matter what you said on that day or, or even today. What matters is on the last day, will you have faith that stands? It doesn't matter what experience you had or emotion you felt or prayer that you prayed on that day when you were 12 or when you were 35 or whatever it was, but what will your faith look like when it's all said and done? Will you have genuine, real faith, a faith that is evident in your life that will be there in the end? And so by his grace, to get you and to get me to the last day, he will test you by allowing trials of various kinds to come to your life. Now, we don't think like this. Like, we think the goal of life is to, be, is to make the most of what we have here. I mean, let's just be real. We think the goal is to be successful. Or, or the goal is to have a good job that makes us, you know, enough money to enjoy life and to raise a family. The goal of, the goal of life is to get the grade to get on the team, to have those friends, to get married, to have kids. And when trials hit, especially a trial that threatens any of those things, that get in the way of those things that we're after, then we're devastated. But if your goal is to know God, if your goal is to have a faith that endures to the end, if your, if your goal is becoming more like Jesus, then when trials hit your life, then you can take joy in that trial because no matter how difficult it is, you know that it, whatever that is, is moving you toward the thing that you want more than anything else in this life. Look, I, I know that in order for you and I to have a James 1-3 kind of life, Man, that's going to require a radical kind of life that is unlike anything we've seen. It's a radically, it takes a radically God-centered perspective of this life. I mean, think about your life. I mean, think about the, the, the thing that you're going through right now. Think about the trial that you're experiencing right now in your life, the big or small. Listen, if the, if the goal for your life right now is to just fix whatever that thing is, just to make that thing go away, then you are setting yourself up for a lot of frustration in your life. That's because oftentimes trials, as we see them, will not get fixed the way we want them to get fixed. And sometimes they will not get fixed at all. And even if it does, something else eventually will show up. And if your joy is riding on your circumstances, you will live in constant anxiety and constant fear. But if your goal is to know God, to have a faith that endures to the end, then you can rejoice no matter what is going on in your life because you know that God is using it to achieve your goal. John Newton, he's the writer of Amazing Grace, 1700s, from the 1700s, and he He said this. He said, everything is needful that he sends. Nothing can be needful that he withholds. Everything is needful that he sends. Nothing can be needful that he withholds. If it comes to your life, 
If it's, if it's a trial that's coming to your life, it's a hard thing that's come to your life, it's because you need it, even if it's bad. And if it has not come to you, you don't need it, even if you think you do. Listen, you're a follower of Jesus. Trials are coming. And by God's grace, he's sending them as a test to reveal the reality of your faith. To give you a faith that will endure to the end. Just a word of of warning to wrap up. There's something about when trials hit our lives that they can be the all-consuming thing in our life. Like you hit a trial, you hit something coming, a hard thing coming in your life, man, it's the, thing, it's, the, it's the only thing you can think about. It just consumes you. It can be hard to think about anything else. It, it seems as though everything is colored by the hard thing that you're going through to where it seems impossible to see, to see anything other than the pain that you're experiencing. And it can also cause you to become less aware and less sensitive to the pain that others are going through. I guess what I'm saying is that trials, hard times, can easily cause us to turn in on ourselves and become self-absorbed. And this is the fight of the will. This is why James says you need to think correctly about the trial. You need to think correctly about what you're going through. Count or consider trials in this way. Think about trials in the right way. And it's a fight. James is saying, and it's a fight to get there. But when you do, your eyes become less focused on yourself. And you begin to see the presence and the goodness of God. Confident that whatever is happening, that it's his good hand that is on your life. And he is preparing you for the next 80 billion years. Well, you will experience a life of no trials. Because there will be no need for faith in that day.